uh, the Minister for Energy, Clean Growth and Climate Change, Greg Hans, joins us in the studio. Morning. Good to see you in the flesh, um, Minister. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I think you know where we're going to start this morning. Four very, very senior individuals in Number 10 have left or are about to leave. With the greatest respect, just, just what the hell is going on in Number 10 at the moment? Well, uh, let's not forget that on Monday, the Prime Minister, when responding uh, to the Sue Gray report update, made clear that there would be changes at the top in number 10. Uh, resignations have been made. Resignations have been accepted. These are all people who've done fantastic uh, service uh, to the country uh, throughout the pandemic in, in almost all of those cases. And we should be thankful for them for their service. But the Prime Minister was absolutely clear on Monday uh, that there will be changes at the top in number 10, and that is what he's delivered. Well, well three of the resignations may well be a response to Sue Gray. Manira Mirza, who we'll talk about in a second, that has nothing to do with that. But in terms of the three that you identify as a response to the Sue Gray update, why didn't the Prime Minister wait for the Metropolitan Police to conclude their investigation? Well, because he was clear on Monday that there would be changes to the operation. Yeah, but he did say he was going to do those immediately. Obviously, he, some... did, he did say to... And I, and I have to admit, it's, it's been the mantra from government for many weeks now. Wait for Sue Gray. Sue Gray provided an update. Then it was wait for the Metropolitan Police investigation to conclude. Hasn't the Prime Minister, in accepting these resignations or perhaps even pushing for them, simply, you know, drawn conclusions that he shouldn't have done before the Met had done their job. No, I disagree with that. This is about the Prime Minister uh, saying that there were... The Sue Gray uh, report update said that there were uh, failings at the top, at the top of the operation. Uh, this is the Prime Minister taking charge as a wider issue than just... Uh, the Sue Gray report, it's actually saying that we need changes at number 10, which is what the Prime Minister said he would deliver on Monday. OK, so who, who are replacing the, the, the Chief of Staff, then? Who's replacing the Chief of Staff? Well, I understand that Dan Rosenfield is carrying on until mm -hmm. such a time as he is replaced. Uh, we will see. You know, I would expect uh, the Prime Minister to appoint a very, very capable person yep. uh, or capable people in those roles. It is, after all, a great honour uh, to work at Number 10 and to serve your country, and I'd expect very capable people to be in there. See, the only, the only problem with that analysis is that if this was part of some carefully thought-out and constructed plan, surely you would have the names of those who'd be replacing them ready to go. Isn't the simple fact of the matter that the Prime Minister rushed out a couple of resignations that were planned for next week because Manira Mirza marched out the front gate number 10? Well, the, the resignation of Manira Mirza is a little bit different. I accept that. Uh, she made clear her reasons for her resignation. The Prime Minister equally clear that he disagreed with her. But nonetheless, Manira is somebody who's put in an amazing service. I know as a London MP yep. uh, the incredible role she's played for uh, Boris Johnson, both as Mayor of London, now as Prime Minister. Uh, and we shouldn't leave without uh, paying tribute to the amazing work that she's done um, for the people of London, the people of the country, over the past 15 years. Sure. Well, let's, let, let's not gloss over why uh, Manira Mirza quit number 10. You know, there are suggestions that there are plenty of other reasons rather than those stated, but let's just take a quick look at, at the stated reasons, if we can bring up that graphic. Uh, she says this, I believe it was wrong for you to imply this week that Keir Starmer was personally responsible for allowing Jimmy Savile to escape justice. There was no fair or reasonable basis for that assertion. She continues, you're a better man than many of your detractors will ever understand, which is why it is so desperately sad that you let yourself down by making a scurrilous accusation against the leader of the opposition. And it's not even, not just Manira Mirza who feels that the Prime Minister spoke out of turn uh, in linking Jimmy Savile to Keir Starmer. Here's what the Chancellor had to say uh, on this particular topic yesterday. With regard to their comments, uh, in you know, being, being honest, I wouldn't have said it, and I'm glad that the Prime Minister clarified what he meant. So you've got Manira Mirza resigning over this, the Chancellor saying he wouldn't have said it, Simon Clark, of course, saying that he believed it was an entirely reasonable remark. Would you have said it? Uh, look, uh, the Prime Minister was clear yesterday in response to Manira Mirza's resignation that he disagrees with the basis of her resignation, what she had to say. The Prime Minister was also clear on Wednesday that he was referring back to the public apology mm -hmm. uh, made by Sir Keir Starmer in, I think it was 2013, and it was all about a wider thing, about taking responsibility uh, for an organisation, for sure. the failings within it? an organisation. Would you have said it in the way that the Prime Minister did, protected by parliamentary privileges, uh, pr privilege at PMQs? Well, look, uh, the Prime Minister said that he disagreed yesterday with the basis of the resignation of what Manira Mirza had to say. And that, that, I think, is the end of the matter. 
Well, it's not the end of the matter, because I'm going to ask the question for a third time. Would you have said it? Look, I'm saying the Prime Minister disagreed with what she had to say. That is the important thing here. Uh, these are all events that happened many, many years ago. The time is now to move on and look at what the country wants us to focus on, which is recovery from the pandemic, further vaccination rollout, uh, move to net zero, the energy transition. I get, I get the impression I'm not going to make much headway on that particular question. So let's do that, that which you ask and, and move on to the measures which the Chancellor was announcing yesterday. You know, measures which I'm sure plenty of people will warmly welcome. Extra money as we see the cost of uh, living soar. But let, let's just look at a couple of the, the ways in which the, the Chancellor described the council tax money and the energy uh, cap money yesterday. Let's just have a quick look at what he said yesterday. He said this... It's a flat rate, a flat £200 and a flat £150. That's obviously going to mean more to families on lower incomes or with lower energy bills. So in that sense, it's a progressive measure that will help those families more. Has Rishi Sunak just redefined progressive? <laughs> no, I sat next to him in the House Commons uh, when he made the announcement yesterday. Uh, as we know, energy bills, I'm the energy minister, are quite regressive. Mm -hmm. Uh, therefore, the more that you can provide uh, for those uh, on lower and middle incomes, uh, the better. That is why we've also done things like the rise in the national living wage from mm -hmm. £8.91 an hour to £9.50 an hour, giving somebody on the national living wage an extra £1,000 in their pay packet. These council tax rises for those living in bands A to D, uh, and also the households on energy, uh, with the energy bills, that uh, uh, £200 uh, discount on their energy bills, all of these will give a lot of help to those not just on low incomes but also middle incomes who are going to be hit by the rise in energy bills sure. that will come in from April. But it's just that whenever politicians have used the term progressive in the past, particularly with progressive taxation or so on, it's a measure which takes into account the circumstances of the individual affected. This, this pays no attention. Certainly the £200 uh, towards energy bills pays absolutely no heat to the individual circumstances, does it? Well, look, the overall package, so things like the council tax mm -hmm. uh, rebate for those living in bands A to D properties, there's also £144 million for local authorities um, to uh, deal with people who, for example, are in low income but have high energy bills. These are all very progressive measures, as, of course, is the national living wage increase and the changes in the universal credit taper rate, all of these will actually really help people on low and middle incomes. I, I, again, I'll just make the point, it doesn't strike me as particularly progressive to be handing out to everyone, those who desperately need it and those who perhaps do not desperately need it, £200. But, but more than that, why are we describing it as a rebate when it is pretty clearly a loan? OK, it is a discount. First of all, you've got to look at, in terms of whether the message, uh, whether the, the whole set of measures are progressive, mm -hmm. you've got to look at all of the measures that were announced by the Chancellor yesterday and at the budget in November. We are describing the energy bill mm -hmm. uh, change as a discount. The mm -hmm. council tax is a rebate. The council tax uh, gets given to you £200 okay. one-off, will not be repaid. Uh, the £200 on energy bills is a discount because that will be repaid by the bill payer. But over a five-year period, mm -hmm. that's quite a long period of time to be able to repay that. The, the, the reason for the <coughs> five-year period, as I understand it, is by that point you seem fairly certain that that is when wholesale prices, energy prices, may have returned to normal. No, so I'm, that, not, the, I'm oh, not predicting energy prices. Sure. But what we are saying, that energy prices have been incredibly volatile. Of course, of course. You know, they're four to five times the average over the last 25 years yeah. at the moment. Uh, but they're actually equally half the peak. So energy prices are very volatile. We're not doing a prediction on energy prices. What we are saying is that people need help now, which is why we are giving people the £200 discount, which will come in in October. But it's certainly been mentioned by those <laughs> in the government that 2024 is a point by which, you know, wholesale, the wholesale prices market may well have just calmed down a little bit. That certainly there's been something that's said. So I'm, I'm wondering, with energy prices expected to remain at high levels for a number of years, is this a one-off? It can't be a one-off, can it? Well, we'll have to see what the decisions of the future in relation mm -hmm. uh, to energy... You're bills. not ruling it out. You're not suggesting that this is a one-off payment and that's it. Look, there it, may well be future is, assistance. It is my job to make sure the country is prepared on all things related to energy. It's not my job to make, uh, if you like, energy price forecasts uh, for the future. Energy prices have been elevated for the last nine months or so. They've also been very volatile in mm -hmm. that time. That is why we're bringing in that support uh, right up front, the £9 billion package of support announced by the Chancellor yesterday in response to 
energy price rises and other price rises coming in this year. But just, but just on, on the council tax rebate, I mean, the, the Times describes it as loopy and lopsided. The point that they make, London boroughs with huge property prices will receive the same as properties in the Midlands and the North, indeed, that actually pay hundreds more in council tax. It, again, not progressive. Well, that's why we've got the £144 million extra uh, for local authorities to look at those cases where um, somebody is on low income but has a high energy bill, e.g. living in a high value property that will be in council tax bands uh, E and above. Yep. Uh, that's also why that fund is there also for people who don't pay council tax, people on very low incomes who don't pay council tax at all. That is why we have the £144 million local authority fund. Why does the Prime Minister seemingly not pay any heed to the optics of what he is doing at the moment? I mean, let's just reflect on what happened yesterday. The Bank of England told us that we're in for a record slide in living standards. That, you know, the, the Governor of the Bank of England himself on roughly, well, in excess of 500 grand a year tells us all not to ask for big pay rises. On that day, the Prime Minister, to an event in Blackpool, takes a private plane. Well, well, look, uh, I, I can promise you the Prime Minister travels by train a lot. Uh, I see him on the train. He, 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 going by train is, is like... To Black Prime Minister Pool. loves trains and buses. Well, I mean, we uh, all kicked off. One we of all kicked off about Liz Trust taking the plane to Australia. Okay, well, you can't expect us well, not to kick off about this. Hold on a minute. No, the Prime Minister's had a difficult schedule this week. Don't forget, you know, he's responded to the Sue Gray uh, uh, update on Monday. He's been mm. to the Ukraine on Tuesday. He shaved now, that is a long minutes. distance. He shaved 50 minutes off his journey by he's flying come in back. private jet. Well, hold on. But he's come back on Wednesday to answer Prime Minister's questions in the House of Commons. On Thursday, he's in Blackpool. That is a difficult schedule for anybody at the best minutes, of times. Uh, and I know the Prime Minister, and he is somebody who instinctively loves public transport. That's what I saw when he was Mayor of London. I was one of his MPs in London. He is somebody who loves public transport, but that's been a difficult... You would agree, that's a difficult, challenging schedule this week for him. Minister, great to have you on the programme this morning. Thank Thanks you. for joining us.